Before we proceed to the plaintiff's closing statement, I have a comment to make. During counsel's closing statement, she indicated words to the effect that she annoyed the judge and probably uh, the plaintiff's attorneys too. This is not about annoying anyone. As uh, professionals, as attorneys, attorneys are obligated to uh, abide by the rules of court and rules of professional conduct. Um, because of my concern with regard to that, I'm striking the entirety of the defendant's closing statement to you. So now let's proceed Check to uh, no need for mistrial, Your Honor. Overruled, sit down. Let's continue now with plaintiff's uh, summation. Thank you, Your Honor. Try to get out of everybody's space. Afternoon. So before I start, I, I have been Throughout the entire trial, I've been trying to parse this evidence and put it into a, uh, a format that, because um, there's a lot, um, hundreds and hundreds of documents that, that is both chronological but also tells each piece of this story. And I want to be very clear, this story, no one knew anything about this story until Johnson & Johnson was forced to turn over its documents. No one did. Not the doctors, not Dr. Longo, not Dr. Moline, not Dr. Weber. No one did. Not the treating doctors. You've heard the chronology in this case that, that our clients were all here, by the way, um, on the first row back there, that every one of them was diagnosed with mesothelioma before Johnson & Johnson was ever forced to turn over their documents that nobody had seen. Now let me back up a little bit. This jury ultimately will be six people. Um, the court will choose six people and three will be alternates. Of those six, any five people can agree on any one question. Okay? So as you go through that verdict form, which I'll go through with you, any five can agree on a question. Hopefully all six of you do, but any five can. D'Angelo McNeil said, everything happens for a reason. And she's right. What happened here did happen for a reason. But it didn't have to happen. Johnson & Johnson could have chosen to do the right thing and still have made all their money. This isn't a case about what we're saying we're here to hurt Johnson & Johnson. I don't know that you could hurt Johnson & Johnson. But they could have still made all of their money if they had, when that decision point came along, in the 1960s, where they were finding what they were finding in the product and switched right to cornstarch. They could have done it. There was always a safer option, one that didn't cause cancer, and it's right there. There was always a safer option, one that didn't cause cancer, cornstarch. We'll get into the reasons why they went all in on Talcoville. We've introduced all of that evidence for you. In their words, it was the golden egg. You saw the video of the gentleman who gave the introduction to that conference. And we'll show it again because there was a lot of evidence. It was the golden egg, and it was the golden egg for a lot of different reasons. It was the gateway product for a lifetime of use of Johnson & Johnson products. That's why the baby powder was so important. It wasn't the amount of money they made from the baby powder. It was that it was the symbol of this company. All right, before I get into evidence, I want to say, first of all, um, on behalf of our clients, we really, really appreciate your time here. This was two and a half months. Everybody was always here taking notes. I hope that 
regardless of what your decision is, I hope that you each learn something. I hope, I hope you took something from this. Um, the jury system is incredibly important, and it's not just it's not just me saying that. It's it's a fact because you're not beholden to anybody. That that's and that's something that we've seen in this case, and we're going to talk about that. Whether it's consultants or it's the FDA or the government or the companies themselves, who are they beholden to? You're beholden to nobody, and that's a wonderful thing. So we thank you very very much for your time. Johnson & Johnson stood up here. Johnson & Johnson, after everything you've seen, after all the documents we went through, after countless lies, I'm going to show you every lie that I can remember. And there were lies. And that's a big word. That's a powerful word. You know, in law school they say, don't call someone a liar unless you can absolutely prove it. Johnson & Johnson is a liar. Dr. Hopkins is a liar. <laughs> Those are facts. I'm going to show you those lies. But they say, give us a fair shake. Give Johnson & Johnson a fair shake. There's four people that are going to die of this cancer. But give us a fair shake. Give Johnson & Johnson a fair shake. After five decades of deleting results, altering reports, backdating them, and hiding the results, give them a fair shake. We have the burden of proof. That's why we go last here. We have the burden of proof. And that burden of proof is by a preponderance of the credible evidence. So we have to tilt those scales, kind of like that. We don't have to prove this case by beyond a reasonable doubt, like in a criminal case, right? In a criminal case, you're taking somebody's freedom, you're putting them in jail, something like that. This is not beyond a reasonable doubt. This case, as you have all known all along, and it's something we asked you about in Vore Dyer, in jury selection, was this is a case, it is a case about money. In the civil justice system, we can't force them to stop selling the product. We can't force them to put a warning on it. We can't force them to go on, on TV and tell people the truth. The only thing we can do is hit them in their nervous system, which is their pocketbook. That's the only thing we can do. So that is what this case has always been about. We've never run from that. Ms. Sullivan kept saying, and she, she put up a picture of a money train, these cartoons of money everywhere. Why did she do that? To prey on the prejudices that people have against lawyers. Uh, unfortunately, we picked, when we decided to be lawyers, it was to represent her people, right? But it's very, very easy to point at the plaintiff's lawyers and say, look at those greedy guys. And that's what she did this whole trial, from the very start. Think about, in the documents we saw, right, how did Johnson & Johnson respond when it truly independent researchers found asbestos in their products? How did they respond? They responded with two words. Compromise them. This was weeks ago when Dr. Hopkins was on the stand. I'm going to show you some of those documents, but that's how they responded. And, and again, I mean, I'll come back to law school. You, you learn how to, well, you hope you learn how to try a case. But one of the things they say is, you've got to have a theme. You have to have a theme, right? Tie everything together. Well, I think Johnson & Johnson wrote the theme for us. Because whether they were talking about independent researchers, or whether they were talking about us or our clients, it went from compromise them to compromise us. Another thing they say in law school is, I'm, I'm actually pretty far removed from law school. I might not totally look like it. But another thing they say is, when you have the facts, you pound the facts. When you have the law, you pound the law. When you have neither, you pound the desk. So how much of Ms. Sullivan's closing was about trying to insinuate motives about us? What do our motives have to do with this case? Yes, this is how we make a living. This is how we make a living. Do we ever lie to you in this case? Do we ever do that? 
No, Johnson and Johnson told lie after lie after lie, and they still have the gumption to say because we're plaintiff's lawyers just looking for money and they're an easy target. What a windfall defense, right? What a windfall defense. In every case where Johnson & Johnson is sued, in every single one, they can say, we're a big target. We're such an easy target. You should let us go. You should give us a fair shake. That's when we talk about evidence versus innuendo. And there are rules here. And you saw the rules in action in this trial. You shouldn't have to have seen them in action as much as you did. Because Johnson & Johnson decided that the rules didn't apply to them. They decided that when the judge made a ruling, to ignore them. Objection, Your Honor. Oh, Sit down. Repeated. Not fair. Your Honor, this is sit not down. fair. It's gone. There's gone. nothing fair and there's not been right. It needs to sit stop. down. Stop the outburst. Continue. And then casting yourself as the victim when you chose to break the rules over and over and over in this trial. The case isn't, shouldn't have been about that. We didn't make it about that. Johnson & Johnson made it about that. The case should be about the evidence. But what did they do? What did they throw at the wall in this case? The cosmetic testing was really industrial, right? That's what Hopkins said over and over again. That peritoneal mesothelioma isn't caused by asbestos. That's a new theory, by the way. That's espoused by about three people. And I'm going to show you that. That there's good rocks and bad rocks. Again, you know, nobody looks at it that way. In the real world, nobody looks at good rocks and bad rocks. It's a way to try to, I don't know, dumb it down? There's no basis for that in science or anywhere. Everything was spiked. Anytime there was a positive sample, it, was spiked. it must have been spiked, whether we could prove it or not. The samples were faked. I, I don't know if you recall this, but when counsel was crossing Dr. Longo, she said, she actually said, and again, the judge had to admonish her again. She said, well, you don't know what the plaintiffs did with them when they got them before they gave them to Dr. Longo. Straight contamination. Everyone recanted, right? Anybody who ever said anything, they totally changed their mind. They said, I'm sorry, I'm a scientist. I've been doing this my whole life, but I was wrong. That they had a super duper microscope, remember? They tried to blame diverticulitis for mesothelium, one of our clients. They said, there was a sample where the FDA found tremolite in shower to shower. And they said, oh, no, it's actually this one over here. And I'm going to show you that, because that was another lie. All four of these cases, spontaneous, 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 spontaneous. That there was an asbestos scare. And I'll pause here. The reason you say something like that very skilled work is to say there was a scare because what does a scare imply a scare implied implies that there was really nothing behind it when you say there was a scare that's what you're suggesting there was really nothing behind it. that's why miss sullivan every chance she got in the 70s to say oh was that part of the asbestos scare these are the things that as jurors you hope to be dealt with honestly in a straightforward way. That's one of the many ways you warrant. Objection. Oh. And then urban legends, and we'll talk about urban legends in a minute. So, motion opening shows you a puzzle. And there are four pieces to this puzzle. First is, and this is the piece that was completely absent from their closing. Absent completely. And it is the one thing that they could not rebut, no matter who they brought in, whether it was Dr. Diet or Dr. Atanus. They had infant exposures, every one of them. Infant exposures are far more important, more significant than exposures later in life. 
all of our clients had infant exposures. Two, there's asbestos in the baby powder. We proved that. Three, there are no other causes. And four, they all fit the latency period, the average latency period of 20 to 60 years. Okay. Those four things led to a signal tumor, mesothelioma. Again, and I have to point this out, that what Dr. Atanus did to come in here and say, well, we used to think it was a signal tumor, it's really not anymore. That fits right in line with the people he works for. It's not just Johnson & Johnson. Remember, Dr. Atanus is the one that says there's a safe type of asbestos. A safe type of asbestos for mesothelioma. For the first time yesterday, you heard there's a safe type of asbestos. The reason you didn't hear that before yesterday is because it's not true. But he works for Union Carbide, which has a mine that mined chrysotile asbestos. He works for the brake companies that put chrysotile asbestos in the brakes. So he says, that's the safe type. That's who he is. So you have infant exposure. You can look at it in a linear way, too. Infant exposure exposed to asbestos, no other causes, appropriate latency, and a signal tumor. It's undisputed that there is no known safe level of asbestos. And I'll show you that um, I try to on most of these slides, since what we say is in evidence, what I say, what Ms. Sullivan says is not evidence, I try to put a little evidence sticker in the bottom that would just show you where, I, where that came from in the transcript or what document that came from, okay? So periodically, you'll see a number in there, and that will be the exhibit number. If you want to call back to it when you're um, deliberating, you can go and you can look at that exhibit, because you will have all the exhibits there. So if you, if you say, you know, Ms. Sullivan said one thing, and I think Chris, well, we have two Chris, two Chris P's. I think Mr. Panettier said another thing. Who's right? Let's pull the document and look at the document. We urge you to do that if you believe that there's a dispute as to the interpretation of those documents. You will have them all. <coughs> if a person breathes asbestos, then they are at risk for mesothelioma, and even Dr. Atanius agreed with that. Each exposure to asbestos increased the risk of developing mesothelioma. Again, for mesothelioma, there's no known safe level. And this gets to this issue, this touches on this issue of Dr. Atanius and Dr. Diet, who came in and said, there's no plural plaques, what they call markers. It takes far more exposure to cause one of those than it does mesothelioma. And I'm going to show you some of the science that shows that there's lots of people with asbestos-related mesothelioma and no plural plaques because it takes far less asbestos to cause mesothelioma than plural plaques. Plural plaques is a scarring disease, so is asbestosis. And that's why you don't see them in every case. So for them to stand up and say, Look, none of these people have plural plaques. It must be spontaneous. It's not correct. That's not the science. I'm going to show you some of those studies. And then it's undisputed. Children are more susceptible to asbestos exposure. They have increased cell division and proliferation, rapid respiration, and they're closer to the ground. That sounds pretty basic, but it's true. As, as it, all things being equal, as you have a level of asbestos in the air, and it slowly settles, and it takes a long time. Someone who's my height is exposed here, here, and then it drops down. But a child is continually exposed as that asbestos settles. So being closer to the ground, rapid respiration, and more cell division. They have more uptake of the toxins into their cells. And they were all exposed to Johnson's baby powder thousands of times. It was daily, sometimes several times a day, over periods of years for all of our clients. They all have diffu diffuse malignant mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is a signal tumor for asbestos exposure, and they will all die early. And they know that. They know, they know the truth of this disease. It's no mystery to them. They will all die early. And it could have been prevented. And asbestos caused their mesothelioma. So this is what some of the questions look like on the verdict form. So your verdict form has seven preliminary questions before you get to damages. And I'll take you through this in a little bit. But the first question, and there's going to be one of these for each of 
each of our clients. Okay, so there's one for Doug, David, D'Angelo, and Will. And the first question is, have plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that they were exposed to asbestos from any of the following defendants' health products? And, you know, there's two defendants in the case, even though it seems like there's one, um, but there's really two. There's Johnson & Johnson Corporate, and there's Johnson & Johnson Consumer, Inc. The, the really, the, the only distinction is that up until 1978, Johnson & Johnson made everything. Thereafter, JJCI, and you'll hear me talk to them, talk, refer to them as JJCI, they made the products. So any exposures after 78 are on JJCI and before that, Johnson & Johnson. It doesn't mean that Johnson & Johnson didn't have a role after that. They certainly still had responsibility after that because corporate made all the decisions for everybody. They made the health and safety decisions, the policy decisions. So they have the larger role in this case. So, first question. Did plaintiffs prove by a preponderance of the evidence that they were exposed to asbestos from any of the defendant's top products? So let's talk about that. First of all, the evidence. Who said yes and who said no? Well, Dr. Moline, Dr. Compton, Dr. Longo, and Dr. Weber had either tested it or they had reviewed the documentation of it. Johnson & Johnson didn't call any experts to say their products were asbestos-free. They called two experts. They called a pulmonologist, who in the real world is an asthma expert from Johns Hopkins, and they called Dr. Tanners. As counsel said, she had Dr. Sanchez. She decided not to call him. What she said was, I want to stand with the FDA, and we'll get into that. But they decided not to call the people who had tested their product. And you should ask yourself, why is that? Right? There's the reasons the lawyers give, and then the real reason. I'm going to show you some of the real reasons. But what's the evidence of it? MAS, Dr. Longo's lab, they tested Italian, Vermont, and Chinese. And because there's three eras, right? There's up to the late 60s, which is Italian, then Vermont until about 03, and then Chinese after. And it was 65, 82, and 39% positive for those eras. I mean, Ms. Sullivan said, Dr. Longo is the sure thing. I, I think, I, I don't think this really um, establishes that. Um, in the modern talc, he's finding a minority of it to contain asbestos. Um, you saw his testimony. Uh, and, you know, um, Dr. Longo documented every single regulated asbestos fiber that he found. Remember, there were two rounds. Objection, no evidence, Dr. Longo. Oh, no. So the lab tested two rounds, right? They did the first one, which came from plaintiff's lawyers like myself, my clients, um, came from the internet. Those were the first round of samples. And then the second round, which came directly from Johnson & Johnson. And what these are is, um, first of all, these are exhibit 3695-47. And what these are, you'll find, to the extent you want to look through them is, these are a documentation of every single fiber, whether it was by TEM or PLM every single regulated asbestos fiber that they documented. Ms. Sullivan said, imagine someone picking out pieces of what you said years ago without context. And then she went through a bunch of things Dr. Longo had said. And I want to tell you what the context was in case it's forgotten. First, she said, he testified, vermicu he testi testified that Scott's fertilizer, um, where they used vermiculite, that it was okay that they had used optical and XRD. You recall that? So, and remember what Dr. Longo said. He said there was no dispute that there was asbestos in vermiculite. We weren't looking to see if it was there. They had coated their vermiculite with a resin, and they were using basic methodology to see if anything got outside the resin. That's the context. The next thing she said, well, at one point, before he started testifying about, against Johnson & Johnson, he had said that there was some insulating cement that was 0.5% asbestos, and he said he didn't think it would cause a very big exposure. And then you saw the context of that deposition where he was talking about it. He said, yeah, the guy was an insulator. He was exposed to insulation every day. And then he said they then tested that product, and he said there was a whole lot of asbestos that got free. He said he didn't recall. I mean, remember, she showed all the prior testimony. She said he was asked over and over. Did you ever test cosmetic talc? And he said, I didn't remember doing it. And then he went back and looked, and someone else at his lab had tested Goldbond. 
Okay? And it was a negative. Just like he still sometimes gets negatives. That's the context. The four off-the-shelf samples, right? The, there were four off-the-shelf samples that were negative. They were off-the-shelf in the last two years. They were Chinese. Most of the Chinese is, is better than the Vermont and the Italian. And then she said, well, why are you publishing on this? This big, dangerous thing, why are you publishing on it? And he said, be patient. They're working on it. They've only been testing these things for two years. They're still working on it, as he testified to. And the FDA audit that she brought up, remember, it's not about asbestos. It's confidential. It's about something else. And they still have their FDA lab number. The bottom line is they didn't bring in any of their people to tell you what their results were. No expert to say, Dr. Long goes wrong. Just peripheral stuff. He made $30 million. Right? The lab has, it has three labs. They have four electron microscopes that cost a million bucks a piece. This is a big operation. And since 1985, yes, they've built that much money. Did, did the money create these, these photographs? No. Dr. Compton. He tested samples gathered by defense experts, right, of the source org for both Vermont and Italian, right? 80% of the Italian was positive for asbestos and 85% of the Vermont. <clears throat> then it was verified by J3. Remember, Dr. Longo sent uh, his results to J3, another lab, who then verified the results. So we have Dr. Longo's work, we have Dr. Compton's work, and then we have a third party that verified the results. Ms. Sullivan put up a diagram where she said, oh, they couldn't even figure fibers versus bundles. Remember that? It said 95% disagreement. And Dr. Longo had told you why that was completely wrong and completely misleading. First of all, Dr. Longo testified that under the counting rules, for something to be a bundle, you have to see three fibers. And we looked at this exact document, or this exact picture. He said, well, Dr. Longo, is that a fiber or a bundle? And he said, well, you could count it as two if you look here. It's somewhat subjective. Or you could look at the end where it's stair-stepped, and it looks like more than two. So your analyst could say, well, that's just a fiber because they only see two. Or they could say, it's a bundle because they see more than two. It's sort of subjective. But whether it's a fiber or a bundle, it's regulated asbestos. It's countable asbestos. The fiber bundle is an additional detail they add on their count sheets. But then J3, they sent the samples to J3 to check fiber versus bundle, whether or not they were accurate. And it was 91% accurate. Again, we, this is science. This is an innuendo, right? Ms. Sullivan kept saying, where's the science? Where's, this is the science. They didn't bring any of their science. They had these samples. Everybody got half. One last thing is when they sent the PLMs, right? So for the light microscopy, they sent that to Dr. Poy's lab, J3. And Dr. Longo had found 8 of 20 by PLM of the 20 samples, and J3 didn't see any. And Dr. Longo explained why, two reasons. One is their optics are far better, and two, they spent far more time on it. They spent an average of three hours per sample looking at each one. Some were shorter than others. And again, this is one of those things. Ms. Sullivan said, well, we saw that if it's three hours per sample, then there's more than they, they apparently have days longer than 24 hours at MAS, because how could you do all these samples in that much time? And Dr. Longo sat here and he said, well, I'm looking at the count sheets. And one took an hour, one took two. The next one, they only did two samples. They took four hours a piece. It just depends. Science is, it's not going to be the same every time. You know, Ms. Sullivan said in an opening statement, she said, you know, the truth shouldn't take that long to tell. Right? I agree. The truth is, there's asbestos in baby powder. That's the truth. But when you don't say it, right, and we have to dig it up, it takes a while. 
She said, Dr. Longo didn't even do the analysis. He didn't even do it. Where's the people that did the analysis? MAS has technicians who do the analysis on the TEMs. But you saw this. This is their expert's count sheet. Dr. Compton showed you this. This is why that is so absolutely misleading and so wrong. Because you saw this. This is Dr. Sanchez's count sheet. You see the operator there for TEM? Does that say Matt Sanchez? No, it says John Swope. Their technician. <clears throat> it's so disingenuous to say Dr. Longo didn't even look at it. He didn't even do the work. No, the technicians on the TEMs do the work. He set up the protocol, he wrote the report, he synthesized it, put it all together, just like their expert does. Why didn't they bring their own guy? What is asbestos? If it's a fiber, it's asbestos. The body does not care how it works. That's a fact. And Dr. Hopkins said, fibrous tremolite is asbestos, right? We got him one time to give a clean answer. Fibrous tremolite is asbestos. These are their definitions of asbestos. If it's a fiber of one of those, it's asbestos. It's not much more complicated than that, ladies and gentlemen. The body cares if it's a fiber. That's all it cares about. Not a chunk. If it's a chunk, it's not a fiber. It's not going to cause cancer. Ahara, same thing. Ahara said, Asbestos, you have to have morphology, crystal structure, and chemistry. We had that for every single documented fiber. They said non-asbestos is anything missing one of those three things. That's what the EPA says. And we got that for every single one. Dr. Weber came in, and remember, he's, he was an inspector assessor. So he was actually inspecting these labs. This is a person who knows what asbestos is. He's a lab inspector, and he came and he told you, look, if it is a fiber and it's one of those six regulated minerals, it's asbestos. That is different than what a commercial deposit might say it is. And I'll show you something on that, too. One of the things that Ms. Sullivan brought up was that um, the FDA in 2010, they did some testing of different um, talcs, including Johnson & Johnson, didn't find anything in any of them. And the method they used was Dr. Weber's, but the method he wrote was the four-tile method. You remember that? That this was a transmission electron microscope method for identifying and quantitating asbestos in non-friable, organically bound bulk samples. Organically bound, four tiles. That's what the lab used, and it wasn't the FDA that did the testing. That's very important. It was a contract lab that decided to use that method. So these are just some of the pictures, okay? These are long fibers. Depending on the method, it's either 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 aspect ratio, right? Length to width, 43 to 1, 28 to 1, 34 to 1, 28 to 1. So you've heard the expression, right? If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, right? It's a duck. That's pretty simple. All through the trial, We've asked you to use your common sense, right? So that's a duck. So let's talk about some of the evidence, okay, of what asbestos is. This is Dr. Atanus' paper that he wrote. It says, the biological hazard of asbestos arises from inhalation of fibers. Physical properties such as length, diameter, length to width, aspect ratio, and texture and chemical properties are believed to be determinants of fiber distribution and disease severity, right? What causes disease? The size and shape. The size and shape. Not whether a geologist or someone else might say, this isn't commercial asbestos enough, right? It's the size and shape. The amphiboles, e.g. amosite and chrysotile, are widely accepted as being more hazardous than chrysotile. We know his opinion on that. They are dusty and biopersistent owing to their structure and straight needle-like fibers. Needle-like was a big part of this case. It's one of the words that Johnson & Johnson used instead of calling things asbestos. Dr. Hopkins said, the needle-like structure of asbestos and asbestiform minerals is the quality that gives it the ability to embed in pulmonary tissue and potentially lead to mesothelioma. That's Dr. Hopkins. So now you have Dr. Atanus and Dr. Hopkins, needle-like. 
And then you have Bill Ashton in 1971. Colorado School of Mines did an analysis, and they said, we consider the free non-talc needles but a trace, both on a count and area basis, those particles of tremolite. That's asbestos. And here's a picture from Dr. Longo's testing. There's a needle. It actually almost looks exactly like that hypodermic needle there. Needles, tremolite. That's asbestos. It's not, it's not hard, regardless of how complicated Johnson & Johnson tried to make it in this case. Remember, she said, where's the hairy rock? And this, again, this is one of those times where I'm going to point out to you why this was incredibly misleading. She said, where's the hairy rock? Because look, look, here's what, here's what Dr. Longo found. What's the difference between these two? <coughs> 10 times magnification? 10,000 times magnification. That is, it was so incredibly misleading. You say, where's the hairy rock? You're not going to see hairy rocks in talc. It's ground up. So you see individual fibers. Again, this was easy to show you, easy to disprove what they had done. I'm shocked they did it, frankly. So years later, right? Objection, Your Honor. Objection to personal opinion. Objection to misleading. Objection to the... No speaking objections overruled. Continue. Years later, they got sued, okay, right? So after all of this happens, and they predicted they were going to get sued. They predicted it in 1969. It was Dr. Thompson. I'll show you that document. What did they do? Because remember, they would just refer to it internally. They would refer to it as tremolite, needles, et cetera, et cetera. Right? They didn't feel the need, the need, as we heard here, to say, oh, if it's asbestos, you have to say asbestos next to it. But they changed their tack. What did they do? Ms. Sullivan said, why would we have to talk about cleavage fragments if there's asbestos there? She said, we injected this idea of cleavage fragments, do you remember? So cleavage fragments, the non-asbestos stuff. The reason we had to talk about it, and you saw this with Dr. Compton, is because Dr. Sanchez calls what he finds in the samples cleavage fragments. That's why we... Objection? Overruled. This was discussed with Dr. Compton very early in the case. Cleavage fragments. And I asked Dr. Compton, I said, is that, is that proper to do under that methodology? He said, no. But that's why we talk about cleavage fragments. We didn't inject that into this case. What we found was asbestos. But when you have someone calling it cleavage fragments, you have to address that. So we did. They opened the playbook. This was a playbook, and it started in 1973. This is from 1973. Here is exhibit 2450, okay? Remember, there was a company called R.T. Vanderbilt. They owned a New York mine. And they were trying to persuade people that the tremolite in their mine was something different than asbestos. But it was the same thing. And so J&J and, and Johns Manville were talking about a meeting about this. And it says, Johns Manville is going to take the position that tremolite is an asbestos mineral and they will not go along with the type science which Vanderbilt has been indicating in the confusing the mineralogy of talc. Good rocks, bad rocks. Right? Exactly what happened in this case, exactly what they learned from R.T. Vanderbilt in 1973 is what happened here. Good rocks and bad rocks. The problem is that this has been explicitly rejected by anybody who's looked at this concept. So they took the duck and they just said, it's a cleavage fragment. Right? It's not asbestos, it's a cleavage fragment. Don't believe your eyes. Don't believe your own eyes. See, the only eyes that matter in this case are yours. Because you're the judges of the facts. And so, what they tried to do for this whole case was say, when you see these long fibers that are inhalable fibers, believe they're something else. Believe that they're not asbestos. Confuse the mineralogy of talc. NIOSH, uh, ISO, ASTM, OSHA, EPA, they've all rejected the concept of good rocks and bad rocks. They have all said, if you have a fiber of any of these minerals, it is regulated asbestos. USGS, US Geological Survey, 2006. 
Dr. Meeker says, finally, it seems appropriate in light of the issues addressed in this report to stress that it is absolutely not the role of the analytical or mineralogical communities to make health-based decisions or to make independent analytical assessments that directly or indirectly influence health-based outcomes. In other words, what a geologist might call it has no relevance to health-based outcomes. It is the obligation of the analytical and mineralogical communities to provide accurate, unbiased, and scientifically sound information to the health and regulatory communities so that appropriate and informed health-related policy and regulatory decisions can be made. We should also point out that the counting criteria developed for analysis of asbestos in the workplace or in commercial products may not be appropriate for direct application to what is currently referred to as naturally occurring asbestos. This is the geologists saying, look, if you have a health-based situation, we're going to count asbestos differently than someone who's assessing a commercial deposit. Same year. However, asbestiform describes a crystal growth habit with unique properties such as flexibility and high tensile strength, properties that have never been directly linked to disease. Therefore, using the term asbestiform to differentiate a hazardous from a non-hazardous substance has no foundational basis in the medical sciences. Of course, the real issue lost in these arguments is not what fits someone's mineralogical or commercial definition of asbestos, but what is toxic. And that's why we call people like Dr. Brody, who's actually studied asbestos effects on the cells and DNA. That's why we brought Dr. Moline and Dr. Weber, and Dr. Um, Mattis to talk about those same things. The EPA answered this question in 2006. They said, for purposes of public health assessment and protection, EPA makes no distinction between fibers and cleavage fragments of comparable chemical composition, size, and shape. They said, from a health standpoint, there is no different, no evidence that supports making a distinction between the two. I'm going to skip ahead. In terms of epidemiological data and health outcomes, the cleavage fragment argument is without merit. That's our EPA. So, these are some of the pictures of some of the asbestos that is found in Exhibit 3695-47. And if you choose to look at these, remember that every single one of these is regulated asbestos, and that's undisputed in this case. It's undisputed. As much as Johnson & Johnson tried to attack Dr. Longo and attack Dr. Compton, it's undisputed these are regulated asbestos fibers. Objection. It's disputed. Overruled. And then these are some of the PLM, right? So those I just showed you were TEM photos. These are the light microscope photos. And those are all in there as well. But I want to bring this up because counsel brought this up. She says, look at this, folks. Even Dr. Longo doesn't call it asbestos, right? Because it doesn't say the magic word asbestos. And why is that misleading? We showed you this with Dr. Longo. Look at the count sheet filled out by the, by the uh, analyst. Comments, actinolite, tremolite, and ethophilite asbestos observed. For the same sample, M69042-002. This is just a picture, right? How, how, how base is it to say, look at the picture, it doesn't say asbestos, so see you're being misled. This count sheet's right there. All of Dr. Longo's and Dr. Compton's testing is undisputed by any expert. They had the samples too. And then lastly, on this issue of asbestos, Dr. Longo went through and he showed you pictures where they had taken asbestos out of traditional asbestos products, brakes, joint compound, gaskets, and packing, and showed you that there's no difference between the asbestos they're finding in the Johnson's baby powder and what they found in those products. And they compared them to known references, right? The National Institute of Standards and Technology, there it is. There's asbestos right out of the recognized standard. It's the exact same. There's asbestos in this by anybody's definition. Anybody's definition. The counting protocols that were followed for regulated asbestos or Johnson & Johnson's. 
There's also a consistency here. This is something I noticed as I was looking at the results between the OR and the finished product. Remember this concept of there is some sorting, there is some um, processing that occurs between the OR and the finished product. So check this out. So in the OR, for the Italian, it was 80% positive. And in the finished product, MAS had about 65% positive. So you lose about 15% between the OR and the finished product. And then check out the Vermont about 14%. So that's some pretty incredible consistency between the raw ore and then what you actually wind up with in the finished product. And Dr. Longo at MAS and MVA, Dr. Compton, they didn't work together on these. Those were independent. So you see that relationship between the raw ore and what goes in the final product. So based on just their testing, if you buy 10 bottles between 7 and 8, are going to contain detectable asbestos. But it's extremely important to remember, and this is for the Vermont and, and Italian years. In the Chinese years, it's going to be between three and four. Okay? But the important thing to remember here is that Dr. Longo said, look, there's, a, there's an error rate. And I think one of, one of our jurors asked the question of, I believe it was Dr. Longo, how do you take a result from uh, a small portion of the talc and relate that to the whole bottle. And he talked about how it's homogenized, and so you can relate it to the entire bottle or the entire sample because it's homogenized, um, which means mixed up. So it's not like you have a big chunk of it here and then nothing anywhere else. And he talked about the fact that, but you also have to accept that if you have a non-detect bottle, because remember, he's not going down to absolute zero. There's not enough time in the world for that. That some of those bottles that were non-detect, if you went down further, would likely be detects. But at where he was, you had between 7 and 8 positive for every 10 bottles purchased. We also talked about cashmere bouquet. And remember that Ms. Sullivan said, cashmere bouquet has nothing to do with this case. That's wrong. We talked about cashmere bouquet because what we wanted to show you, ladies and gentlemen, was that Dr. Longo isn't just talking about Johnson & Johnson. He's not just testing Johnson & Johnson. He's tested others. And cashmere bouquet has a common ore source. And for 15 of their samples, they were the same ore source, the Italian Valch's own talc. And they were 60% positive. So that's an independent verification for another brand's product. So they told, Dr. Longo and Dr. Compton told JJ what they already knew. Right? We knew that because, of course, you saw me go through it in great detail and at great length with Dr. Hopkins. How did they describe or discuss asbestos, Johnson & Johnson now? Remember, they, they said, well, it doesn't say asbestos. The document doesn't say asbestos. And Ms. Sullivan made a very big deal about these boards, which I want to point out. I asked Dr. Hopkins, I said, you've been through all of these. And I made these boards. I, I personally typed them up and made them. And I asked Dr. Hopkins, I said, did I misrepresent any of the words here for the documents that are included? He said, no, they're all... Everything on there is exactly what you put there, okay? And this is important because what Johnson & Johnson did was they said, well, that doesn't say asbestos right there. That's right. The document doesn't say asbestos. I agree. What they had was they had, for instance, this one, 1958. They had 30 different results on their Italian talc of tremolite, findings of tremolite. Now, if tremolite was no big deal and it was always there and everyone knew it, why are they looking for it over and over and over and over and over again? Why do they care if it's no big deal, if it was such an obvious thing? Okay? Because it was important. Because before you can have fibers, you've got to have the mineral. You've got to have the mineral first. If tremolite's not there, you don't, have a, you don't have to worry. If actinolite is not there, and thophylite or crest tile aren't there, you don't have to worry. So the types of words that they used in the internal documents were words like asbestiform, or fibers, or fibrous, or fiberform, or rods, or deleterious materials, right? Elongated, fiberform. Now, Dr. Hopkins would, Hopkins would show up and say, oh, oh, that doesn't say asbestos. And that's what they hung their hat. Okay? I kind of thought to myself, this is kind of like, what's a good analogy for why this is so ludicrous, right? They were looking for asbestos. They were looking for fibers, and they always found them. 
It's sort of like if you, uh, I don't know, if you owned an ice cream shop and someone said, well, what, what do you have? And you said, well, I got pistachio, I got chocolate, vanilla, um, I got uh, birthday cake flavor, s'mores. And they said, okay, but what about the ice cream? Do you have any ice cream? You go, well, I just told you the flavor. Well, you didn't say ice cream. You didn't say it, so how can I know you talk about ice cream? They are specifically looking for asbestos in these samples, and they continue to find these things. This is how they describe them. And then they want to say, we're looking for asbestos, but we didn't say it, so it's, it's not actually there. That's not a positive finding. In 1990, we showed you this document with Dr. Weber very early in the trial. Fibrous minerals, tremolite and actinolite, are ubiquitous. That means everywhere. In several zones of the Vermont mines, the potential problems involved with, fi with fiber in dumps and to some degree in products must be carefully evaluated. Again, remember, Ms. Sullivan said, everybody knew there was tremolite in it. That's not true, guys. It's not true. All right, at a point, they were unable to plug the dam anymore and it came out. Because think about it, if tremolite's not a big deal, if it's just something that's there, everybody knows it, why do they care about it? Why do you have to carefully evaluate the fibrous tremolite that's there? Because it's asbestos. They say it's impossible to get rid of accidental traces. This is 1990. I'm just gonna say that once you know it's there, it's no longer an accident. If it continues to make its way into products, it's no longer an accident, right? At the beginning of the trial, Mr. Lyman stood up and he said, no one is going to stand up here and tell you that you have to find that Johnson & Don Johnson intentionally added asbestos to this. No one believes that. No one believes that when they started selling this that they had any idea about it. But in the 50s and 60s, they learned about it. And that's the decision point. That's where you have to evaluate them and say, did they do the right thing or did they do the wrong thing at that point? Because they knew. So it's no longer an accident if you know it's there. Remember, on like the third or fourth day of Dr. Hopkins, all of a sudden there was this concept of selective mining, right? They went from saying that our mines are asbestos free, asbestos free to we selectively mine them, okay? That's a fallback position. That's what we call that. Right? Look what they say. The geological studies are based on drilling holes and surface drive surveys where visual information only was reported. Visual information only. No analysis were made on drilling cores for what percentage talc, AS, etc. I'm sure that Dr. Hopkins would say, well, that doesn't say asbestos. Right? The miners also use only visual factors for sorting the ores that can differ of the above mentioned grades, cosmetic, industrial, roofing, talc. These types of ore are blended to make one quality per plant. Remember this whole debate about industrial and cosmetic? They were blending them together, and we have countless documents that talk about this. The quality management of ore is unclear and by far the weak point of the operation. Dr. Hopkins testified that, I asked, so they're processing the roofing talc in the same place and same building as they're processing the cosmetic, correct? That's what it says, in the same building, yes? There has been asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's talc, correct? Answer, there have been reports of traces in industrial talcs. Now, that was his fallback position. We've got plenty of documents that show it in the cosmetic, but that's what he said. Accepting that is true, they were milling them in the same building, and they were blending them to form a common ore. Here's, here's how it worked, and this is what we saw in this case. There's Hammondsville, HC, right? Hammondsville Cosmetic, and there's Argonaut. Argonaut came online in about 76. And then for a very small time, there was a mine called Clifton, okay? They all go to Windsor Mill, and out of Windsor Mill, you get the baby powder. I, actually, I think I actually drew this on the board. This whole concept of HC can mean industrial is kind of true and kind of not true. It's kind of not true if you're trying to suggest that it's something different than the cosmetic talc. That's not true. It is true that they took roofing talc out of the same holes they took the cosmetic talc. 
right? So in that respect, it's industrial, but it's the same stuff. And then they were milling all three in the same building. You know, another thing Ms. Sullivan said was, what does it matter if they found asbestos miles away? Okay, first of all, we didn't hear they ever found asbestos miles away. But we did hear that they found asbestos in the waste rock at Argonaut. Now, why is that important? Because no one was here saying, well, that was from directly inside the talc deposit. It was adjacent to it. It's important because they blended the waste rock into the talc board. Remember that on the last day of Dr. Hopkins' testimony, we went over some of his prior testimony, where they said because of poor lighting and poor conditions in the underground mine at Hammondsville, they left some waste rock underneath, and then they blended the rest into the ore because they didn't have anywhere else to put it. All right, told you about the binder. So, the first question, have plaintiffs proven by preponderance of the evidence that they were exposed to asbestos from defendants' top products? The answer to that question is yes. And of course, I've told you about the difference between J and J and JJCI. Another question you're asked is under the heading of defective product. And by the way, defective product doesn't mean broken, right? So it's not like we're here saying, well, when I squeezed the baby powder, uh, sludge came out or something. It's, it's not that. Defective product, there's three different ways a product can be defective. The first is that it's not, uh, that it's unreasonably dangerous. It's not as safe as an ordinary person would have expected. Okay, that's the first. The second is that there, there's a failure to warn. There's no warning or instructions. And the third is that the product itself doesn't meet the company's own specification. Okay. And um, and I will go over this. I'll show you some more of this. Um, and you'll have a chance to write it down to the extent you want to write it down. But those are the three causes of action they're called. And so the first one is manufacturing defect. So it doesn't mean that, um, that it was broken. It means it deviated from the, the voice specification. Right? Have plaintiffs proven by a preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' talc products were defectively manufactured because their composition deviated from defendant's design, specifications, or standards. And we know what their specification was, right? They say no asbestos. That's what they told everybody. No asbestos. It became an official specification in 1977. That's in evidence. This is, I believe, some questioning I have of Dr. Hopkins. Um, so you're going to see two of me in a moment. Johnson & Johnson has always stated that it has a zero tolerance policy for asbestos, correct? Oh, yes. And Johnson & Johnson has always told the public that there's never been a single fiber of asbestos in any of its talc for Johnson's baby power, powder or shower shower, correct? Yes. It told that to customers, nurses, doctors, and regulators and hospitals, correct? Yes. There shouldn't be any asbestos in baby powder, period, correct? Yes. It should be asbestos free, correct? Yes. Asbestos free means zero, correct? Yes. You read any asbestos, baby powder, it's too much. That's what we just said, yes. Okay. So the company has always maintained zero, zero point zero, no asbestos. If there's asbestos in the product, it's a manufacturing defect because it deviates from the standards that the company said it had or deviates from their specifications. That is a manufacturing defect. Again, it doesn't mean it's broken. It means that it deviated from the specifications. So the answer to that question when you come to it on each of these forms is yes. So causation. Part of these questions is also causation. Did the defect, did the product defect, or the failure to warn, did it contribute to cause these diseases? And I expect that Judge Moscomi will give you some instructions on what causation means legally, right? And you're going to have this, so you don't have to write all this down, but I just want to point out a few uh, points. So it says, plaintiff need not prove that the very injury which occurred could have been anticipated so long as it was within the realm of foreseeability that some harm could result from the defect in question. In other words, if there's asbestos in the, in the product, was it foreseeable that some harm could come from that? Of course. If the product in question, however, does not add to the risk of the occurrence, 
of the particular injury, and hence was not a contributing factor in, hap in the happening of the injury, then plaintiff has failed to establish that a particular product defect was the proximate cause of the injury. So it gives you both sides, right? If you believe there was asbestos in this, then that is a proximate cause. If you believe there was no asbestos, then Johnson & Johnson, we have not met our burden. By proximate cause, we mean that a product was an efficient cause of the plaintiff's injury and not trivial or inconsequential. It is not necessary for an exposure to be the sole or even the dominant cause of a plaintiff's injury in order to be considered a proximate cause. There can be many proximate causes of an injury or disease, and there can be many substantial contributing factors to an injury. So what does that mean? What that means is, if somebody has more than one type of exposure to asbestos, you can find them, if you believe that they are more than just trivial, you can find them all to be a contributing factor. And I think a, a good analogy we're all familiar with, right, is, um, let's say someone smokes cigarettes for 50 years, and they smoke Luckies, and they smoke Marlboro, and they smoke Winston's, or whatever, right? And then they get lung cancer. Well, each different source would be a contributing factor. You wouldn't take one out and say that's not a contributing factor. Or if uh, a pond gets poisoned and, and a fish gets sick, but it's poisoned from three different sources, they all contribute. In this case, you don't really have that problem because they were all exposed in the same way to one source of asbestos, and that was the baby powder and or shower to shower. And then it's just got to be more than trivial or inconsequential, and there can be more than one proximate cause. In that regard, substantial means that it is not an imaginary or fanciful factor, having no connection whatsoever, or only an insignificant connection with the harm. The word substantial refers not to quantity, but to quality. The fact that there may have been other independent or contributing causes does not relieve a defendant from liability. There may be more than one substantial factor in bringing about the harm suffered by the plaintiff. All right. More than trivial or inconsequential, not imaginary, and there can be more than one cause. All right. Counsel put this up in her closing. No medical agency has ever, I typed it up kind of quick, ever concluded that talcum powder causes mesothelioma. It's kind of true and kind of not. Because what they looked at was, they said, if it's non-asbestos, we don't think it causes mesothelioma. And on that, the plaintiffs agreed with the defense. If there's no asbestos, it's not going to cause mesothelioma. But if it has asbestos, it does cause mesothelioma. And the same organizations the council was quoting about asbestos-free talc, they all say it's got asbestos, it causes mesothelioma. Okay, it's a carcinogen. And asbestos is what J&J spent 50 years keeping under wraps. I'm going to show you how they did that. But we're on the issue of causation. Lymphatic transport to the peritoneum, right? This was Dr. Brody's slide, and I think some of you even asked some questions about this. So first of all, you inhale it, it's transported through the lymphatics, through the lungs, and then down into the peritoneum. This is why there are fewer peritoneal mesotheliomas. It's no, there's no magic. This is not a different disease. There are fewer peritoneal mesotheliomas because the fibers have further to go. They take longer to get to the peritoneum, but for baby powder, they have a bit of a head start because it's just introduced right after birth. Right? Some people start using it immediately, like our clients did. And I think this is very important. Mesothelial cells in the pleura are no different than they are in the peritoneum. They're the same cell. They're affected the same way. So if you have something, that's why you have a majority of mesotheliomas are up here in the pleura. And as those fibers go down, 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 you have cases in the peritoneum. The cells are the exact same way as the To try to distinguish these as a different disease is not true. That's not scientifically true. That is false. They are the same disease in different locations. Um, another one of our jurors asked uh, Dr. Maddox a question, which is what happens to, or asked, I think it was Dr. Longo, but because he doesn't do, um, he wasn't a medical expert, we asked Dr. Maddox. And we asked Dr. Maddox, what happens to the bundles when they get into the body? And Dr. Maddox actually described, he said, it's a little bit like a cluster bomb, because you've got the bundle, and the body's own fluids pull it apart, and then you have all the individual fibers that go out, and those do the damage. And then Dr. Brody showed you pictures of individual fibers actually doing DNA damage. 
And you can see here that there's DNA bound to the fibers. And I asked Dr. Brody, again, coming back to this issue of how it grew in the ground, does, do these cells care? Does the body care? Does the DNA care how that fiber grew in the ground? No. No. If it is a fiber, it can cause DNA damage. And he told us about this one as well. There's another one where a single fiber is bound to this DNA. And if the tumor suppressor genes are on that DNA, then you have the door open. So then you have the door opening. Dividing cells are extremely vulnerable to fibers. And you remember, I, I, Dr. Maddox did this. He said, he said, the cell is like this, and then when it divides, it does this. And all of the chromosomes are exposed. And Dr. Brody told us the same thing. The nucleus of the cell has a wall around it. And when the cells divide, that wall goes away. And all of the DNA is exposed. And when you are a child, this is happening a whole lot more than when you're an adult. It's happening a lot more. And that's why children are so more susceptible to asbestos, to that injury that can harm DNA and open the door to cancer. Talc with any type of asbestos is a carcinogen. That's universally agreed. Johnson & Johnson didn't stand up and disagree with that. That's just a fact. There's asbestos in it. It's a carcinogen. Did Johnson & Johnson present evidence of disease in millers and miners or users? Well, they focused on the millers and miners, not the users. But that doesn't mean they didn't have evidence of it in the users, and that they couldn't have done a study. So let's, let's talk about that. First, the facts about the Italian and Vermont studies. One, these were extremely small populations of workers. There were only about 1,800 Italian and 392 Vermont workers. Um, not 7,000, OK? You were showed that, um, that slide that Dr. Diet did, and he and counsel for Johnson Johnson tried to sort of wiggle out of that a little bit. The same people were studied over and over, and the cohort moved and shifted. So in one you had 1,400, in another you had 1,200, and in another you had 1,700 or 1,800. And that cohort shifted, but the same people were being looked at over and over again. It wasn't 7,000 people. When you have a rare disease, oops, oh, no, I got it, I got it. I hit, I hit a magical button here. When you have a rare disease, you need a larger population. And I'll just point out that on the Vermont, um, I didn't put this in my closing because I, I, I didn't think to, that I need to say it, but 392 workers, it's in evidence, but Vernon Zeitz, who was at um, uh, Windsor Minerals, who was running the lab there, he was the research and development guy. He actually says in his document where he writes about the NIOSH study, which was at 392 people, he said, whatever the results are, we can write it off because there's not enough people and they weren't working here long enough. But again, that didn't stop Dr. Diet, that didn't stop Dr. Atmos from saying, you should consider this. The main exposures were silica, not talc. This is extremely important. These people got silicosis, pneumoconiosis, broad category, silicosis, smaller category. These were talcosis cases. It's not a mountain of raw talc. It's a mountain of lots of stuff. And those workers are pulling out that lots of stuff. And what were they getting? They were getting silicosis. The talc has been taken away, and that's milled, and that's what's so, sold to people. This is why it's a fallacy to say, we can relate these Meyer and Miller studies to what infants and people who buy this product are, are exposed to. Because they were getting silicosis. That's from quartz. It's not from talc. After 1950, they added dust control and worker, protect, work, worker protection. And then they excluded the oldest workers, right? We know by the latency period. So during the period where the oldest people are and the most susceptible to actually getting these at the allele, they excluded them from the study. We don't know anything about them. They excluded all the women. They originated, funded, and controlled this study from the start. Johnson & Johnson did. They originated all of the Minor Miller studies. Okay? And it, then it was taken over by Dr. Kojiola, who works for Emerus, who owns the mine. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not saying that funding a study is a bad thing. Funding a study is a good thing. Companies should fund studies. If they didn't, I would be here saying they should have. Okay? It is wrong 
to interfere with studies. It is wrong to tell people what you want the results to be. It is wrong for you to contribute to the studies and not be accredited author. That is wrong. And I think we all know that. And in fact, Mr. Mindon asked Dr. Athenus yesterday. He said, when you got when, when you got your papers to be reviewed, right, you sent them, or you got papers to review for other people, did you share them? He said, no, that would be improper. Not according to Johnson & Johnson. They got them all the time. That's what's wrong. I don't want any of you to think that, com that I don't think or we think companies shouldn't fund studies. They should. They should do more. But they shouldn't go that extra mile of influence, which is what they did here. There's no comparison between mine exposures and machine ground finished product. You didn't hear anybody who said, yeah, we can compare these two things. In fact, I'll show you a document in a minute where the FDA said you can't. What might be, what might be healthy for a minor may not be for a child. That's what they told Johnson & Johnson. And then a large percentage of these workers were lost or not followed. There were two peritoneal cancers. And they just said, well, they're not mesothelioma, but they didn't explain what they were. Right? Peritoneal cancer, again, that's just a location. And one of the things that Mr. Miami did with Dr. Diet and Dr. Atnus was he showed you the I IDC codes. And the IDC codes are the disease codes. And in both these studies and in Vermont, they gave a range. It's like 162 to 168. And in that range is mesothelioma. But they don't give any more specifics of what was there. Even if there were no mesotheliomas, the studies are small and they were restrictive. They cut off the older people. But there is a question of what was really there. We have two peritoneal cancers in Italy. And then we have respiratory cancers in Vermont, same IDC codes. And this quote is from Mr. Zeitz, who said, with regards to Vermont, we can further responsibly predict the outcome of the study and even influence the conclusions by way of directional suggestions involving the subjective interpretations of the study groups. Those aren't my words. This is not a conspiracy theory. Johnson & Johnson said this has to be just a massive conspiracy theory. No, it doesn't. A conspiracy theory is a theory. This is real. They said that. They did that. I couldn't have authored a conspiracy theory like this, as in-depth as this. This was introduced yesterday. This is a picture of a guy in the mine. There he is. And they say here, there is very little appreciable dust in the mine. It is cool, moist, and the working conditions clean and pleasant. That's a 71. There's no doubt earlier on it was worse. Of course it was. Things get better. But in 51 is when they brought in the um, dust control and the respiratory protection. And then there was remarkably little dust around these micronizing plants. So now you're in the mill, which suggests that there is little contamination of the atmosphere with talc particles. Again, the concern was silica. Because if you have a talc mine, and you've heard this throughout the case, I think you, Dr. Hopkins said, the good grades of talc, a good deposit is 50% talc. A good deposit is 50% talc. So you're trying to get rid of all the other junk. And this is what Dr. Diet shows you, okay? 7,000 miners, they tried again. Instead of just saying, look, okay, that was, that's, that's not true. There were 7,000 instances of someone being studied. There weren't 7,000 miners. But they, again, today, tried to say that maybe there were. So we know why the Italian studies were done. Um, John, this is, uh, Johnson Johnson exhibit. The purpose was to maintain the good name of talc and compromise Selikoff type allegations. Remember, Selikoff was at Mount Sinai. Counsel for Johnson Johnson said, oh, Mount Sinai, you couldn't, you couldn't hurt them. They, they did whatever they want. They were known for this. Well, Johnson Johnson didn't think so. They were looking to compromise what Mount Sinai was doing. So what did they do? They start the study, okay, the Italian study. And then, what, what do we see now 30, 40 years later? They give the studies to their experts, Diet and Atanus. And then there's the other issue of the internal documents. Remember, Diet said, I don't want them. Agnew said, I recently asked for them. I got them. Some of them, we don't really know what. Um, but I had not looked at them. I got them months ago. I had not looked at them. Right? So the company documents are here. They kind of steer around the company documents, and then they testify about the studies, the Johnson & Johnson initiated to compromise Selikoff allegations to juries. Whatever 
whatever you think about the experts in the case, right? Who shielded themselves from knowledge and who didn't? Okay? Who shielded themselves from what the company actually had to offer internally by way of information and who didn't? The only two experts brought by Johnson & Johnson, neither, have looked at any of the actual internal documents. Why would they choose to remain willfully ignorant of the evidence? So, who reviewed the Johnson & Johnson internal documents? Our experts did, theirs didn't. It was Dr. D Dr. Atanus. Oh, yeah. Remember, counsel has made a big deal about, oh, we, we, they're all out there. They're all out there. When Dr. Longo got these, he had to sign a confidentiality agreement. Do you remember that? He had to sign a confidentiality agreement that says, I won't tell anybody about these. I won't share them. I'll only look at them by my, by my lonesome, privately. Okay? That was signed in August of 2017. Then, because of what has happened, they decided we'll put them online in uh, late 2018. Great. I think it's a little late. And then Dr. Atanu said, the devil's in the details. The devil's in the details, but he didn't want to look at any details. Right? He, he, did, he still hasn't looked at them. The minor and Miller studies cannot be compared to infant exposures. Okay? This is what... This is Exhibit 2506. This is what the FDA said. Dr. Uh, Vodica appeared skeptical of Dr. Ironman's approach to the problem. He implied that what is safe for a minor may not be safe for a baby. That was 1974. And then Dr. Atanus, he testified that inhalation of an amphibole, right? And, and that's primarily what we have here. Okay, we have, we have tremolite, actinolite, enthophilite, and coming tonight. Those are all amphiboles. Inhalation of an amphibole before the age of 30 is disproportionately significant in the induction of mesothelioma. And the health and safety executive, which is their government body there in uh, the UK, agrees. And you saw that document yesterday. So all of our clients were all exposed as infants. Right? Until they were potty trained. And then some of them the rest of their lives. Look at that right there. So, the science on people exposed to cosmetics, how? Before yes. I continue, I think this will be a good time for Okay, yes, Your Honor. Members of the jury, it's time for uh, afternoon break, 15 minutes, we can know from here. Remember, no discussions with regard to this case, and no research of any kind whatsoever. We're ready to come back as soon as it's going over here. didn't even give me a chance to respond before uh, issuing that draconian instruction of the jury striking my closing. We believe it's unfair and not proper, and we move for a mistrial. We'll follow it up with a briefing. It would have been, uh, Your Honor, we submit fair for the judge to give us an opportunity to be heard before that was done, that draconian instruction was given. I did, I thought more. No, Your Honor, you said before we're breaking it to. No, Your Honor, you, you did not permit me to address the issues that you um, instructed on, Your Honor, but I, the record will speak for itself. It will. And Your Honor, then in plaintiff's closing, uh, all of the things that you, um, and, and actually worse, you said that it was improper for me to suggest that they were misleading. They called us liars. They said that I was misleading. They said that I continue to violate your rules. Uh, all improper. They violated multiple and limited motions as, as su submitted in our mistrial motions. Yet you, yet you permit them uh, to make the arguments that you certainly would not permit me to make. Uh, in addition, Your Honor, the, the, the language about money and liars is punitive damage kind of language, uh, inflammatory, prejudicial, not proper in the compensatory phase at all. Um, the, uh, the, 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 
telling the jury and arguing that I had broken the rules and the judge had to continue to admonish me improperly, you've admonished both sides, they violated in, in, in the emotions, uh, uh, blaming the lawyers, attacking the lawyers, things that you would not, in fact, early on in my closing, your honor instructed me that I could not do, now permitting the plaintiff to do it at length, uh, saying that Dr. Longo, when Dr. Longo, um, Mr. Panettiere told the jury that Dr. Longo's audit was not about asbestos. It's not in the record at all. He said it was confidential and he couldn't talk about it. There's no basis in the record for that. He compared um, our product to hypodermic needles, to cigarettes, and to poisons that kill fish, inflammatory, prejudicial, uh, and um, improper. Uh, he gave personal opinions. I'm shocked. This is ludicrous uh, to me, uh, all kinds of personal opinions. Um, they talked about what Dr. Sanchez said or did not say. He's not, never been a witness in this case. They referred to Region 9 as our EPA when they know it's just California, improper um, and misleading. Uh, they talked, uh, the court video was not offered um, to both sides by Your Honor. Uh, had we known that they were using it, I didn't even know there was one. Uh, the fact that the plaintiffs can obtain it and we cannot and then use it is unfair, Your Honor, and improper. Uh, not made available to both sides. Um, to, um, uh, he improperly instructed the jury on the burden of proof, saying once you find asbestos, that's proximate cause. That's clearly not the standard. They've got to prove that there's a sufficient asbestos beyond background to cause it. That's why you, the court has broken down the exposure question and the causation questions into two. He told the jury, once we find asbestos, it's, pro it's proximate cause. Not true. Misstatement of law. Improper. Misleading. Uh, he said that government agencies have found that talcum powder causes mesothelioma. Not one has. Where's that evidence? Uh, no evidence at all. Um, again, more personal uh, opinion. I think this is very important, uh, he said, about a piece of evidence. He accused us of wiggling out of uh, evidence. Uh, again, attacking the lawyers on my demonstrative on epidemiology. He said that all of the epidemiology originated with J&J. No evidence for that. Not true. Improper. Misleading. Um, and also saying that our experts haven't reviewed any company documents when both testified that they actually looked at what the plaintiff's lawyers were cross-examining them on misleading and improper. May I add one thing? Sure. 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 For the record, um, uh, there was, sorry, close to for the record, there was one slide that Mr. Panettiere showed, mm -hmm. and uh, under one of the bullet points it said, there's no drill course analysis of percentage talc, comma, AS period, and Mr. Panettiere said, I'm sure Dr. Hopkins would say, because it doesn't say asbestos, that it doesn't mean asbestos. In fact, in the periodic table of elements, AS is arsenic, and so that is a violation of your honors. Uh, motion to eliminate to keep trace metals out. Um, and that's what we need to do. And also going back, your honor, to the quartz issue, telling us that, saying that we've got quartz in our talent and it's causing silicosis, it also violates and eliminate. Yeah. I, I, I'm happy to respond. Um, there's, there's no there's no arsenic in front of the jury. There was an AS, and I said I'm sure that Dr. Hopkins would tell us it's not asbestos. Um, that's the first thing. But um, with regard to my with regard to my statements about the rules, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Um, Pardon. That's okay. I just want to make sure that the record is accurate. Thank you. I opened very briefly at the start about the importance of the rules and how. We have to follow the rules, and I addressed that because we've been prejudiced by counsel's repeated outbursts, commentary, faces, everything that's happened through this trial. And I spent about one minute talking about that, and how about that's not what you're to consider. You're to consider the facts and the evidence and the law, Your Honor, and to the extent that um, we need to respond to these things in writing, we can respond to them. Please do. The only thing I wish to state at this time is that the court had no involvement with regard to that video. Uh, the court video, which is part of court's mode, is not available to attorneys. Um, I don't know what that video was. Uh, that, that is court's mode. Court's mode is the official record. It, it is. You were able to obtain it. So we're able, uh, the yeah. audience is able to obtain it. All you okay. have to do is go downstairs and purchase it. It's like $10. I, well, I yeah. was not aware of that. Yeah. So it's true. So, so there's no reason I, I'll confess to that. No, so I just want to know, let you know that there was not like there was any kind of ex parte communication with this judge to access a court video. I didn't know that mm -hmm. it was obtainable, and certainly if it is, you know, you're not going through the judge. Right. Yes, and to suggest otherwise, as Ms. Sullivan did, 
is a baseless accusation. Well, well Your Honor, to play a video without any notice, and, and we had no no idea there was access to I mean, if they're going to do something like that, they say we have the court video, video from your permission to play it, and so then a fair playing field would say, well, I'll get it too, and I'll play some too. And ignorance is not an excuse, Your Honor. If you want to find out what the official court record is, that is the official court record. And so reading from a transcript of the unofficial court record is inferior to the official court do record. Do you have, uh, are you planning any other court I smart? I think I have one more. I can show I, counsel. I was yeah. under the impression, and um, so I'd be really cautious about that. I was under the impression that first one, the one that it was not available, and secondly, that it could not be used. I think, I think there's actually a, an appellate division case, I don't know if it's published or not, that came out in the past year or so, regarding the use of that. I, I just thought that was, with all due respect, and not CBA I, or I, I just thought that was CBM. We so, use CBM. Well, okay, but I don't know that you are permitted to use that for purposes of, so I would really... Um, for the rest, uh, I'll just pull it from the rest just in case. So, certainly, Your Honor, it did not appear to have been presented as part of the evidence in the case, but from the viewpoint of the camera, it's certainly not anything that anyone here saw, because no one looked from the viewpoint of that camera as this trial proceeded. Well, it is. And we'd at least like notice uh, when something like that is going sure. to be used. Sure. Whether or not it is prejudicial to Johnson & Johnson is a whole other issue. Whether or not the, 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 there's a court directive or as to the ability to its use, I, I'm not sure. As I said, I believe that there is um, an unpublished appellate division decision that came out in the past year or two, so I would um, recommend that you not use it any further. Yeah, I, I have one more. I'll take it out. Right. Uh, yeah, one more thing. They referenced us uh, uh, talking about diverticular light light is without any proof as it related to Mr. Ryan, an issue that you prevented me to argue or, or uh, talk about, they injected into the case. Uh, I didn't, I, I only brought up diverticulitis, which did come up in the case. I didn't say it with regard to anybody. I just said diverticulitis. So, if, um, are you seeking, are you going to supplement this with the written motion? Yes, sir. Thank you. And then you can reply yeah, sure. it. And I have a whole series of these motions to respond to. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'll see you at 345. Thank you.